Welcome to the kickoff of NCSSM's sustainability project for this year. I want to tell you just a couple things about it before we go on to the rest of the program. There are five students who've been working on this together with a larger committee since last fall. And they've de designed a project that includes a uh, championship competition for teams, it can be from clubs, halls, sports teams, whatever, whoever wants to get involved to design and implement a sustainability related project this year, either on campus or off campus. And there's some really nice prizes at the end, including for the grand prize winners, a dinner at Chancellor Roberts' house. So, uh, <laughs> and I can tell you from personal experience, he sets a great table. So, that'd be a nice thing to get. So, that's the championship. We also have the um, Sustainability Cup. Actually, we're calling the championship the challenge, right? Right, so the challenge, that's the, first, the thing I just mentioned. The Sustainability Cup is a competition amongst halls to basically implement the most sustainability measures in terms of uh, discarding recyclable things in the right places and not wasting water and electricity and that sort of thing. So there'll be more on that later. There are also going to be opportunities during the year to attend other talks and that sort of thing. And uh, we're gonna be sharing this with other schools so that they may get the idea of doing sustainability related projects themselves. Teachers are gonna be uh, sharing sustainability curriculum activities that they do. So, this is a big deal. And not all, we came up with this idea last fall, then after that, the university system let us know that there was gonna be a, a system-wide sustainability effort. And we're a part of that. And what we do in our, what we're calling the Green U Initiative, what we do in that this year will contribute to reducing the university system's footprint overall. So those are some special things that are happening. I would like to introduce to you now the person who is really chairing the student group who has been uh, moving this effort forward, and she will introduce our guest speaker today. She's a senior. Please welcome to the podium, Caitlin Seifred. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. William Winner. Dr. Winner has been involved in developing programs dealing with the environment, energy, and sustainability at the National Science Foundation and Oregon State University. He's devoted most of his professional life to helping students develop careers involving environmentalism and sustainability. Currently, Dr. Winner is Professor of Forestry and Environmental Resources and the Director of the Environmental Science Academic Program at North Carolina State University. Dr. Winner's interest in the environment has been clearly demonstrated throughout his professional career, which is why he was asked to speak at today's first ever NCSSM Sustainability Conference. I now welcome Dr. William Winner to the stage. I think we're changing the order of the video will come later. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here, and I was very excited when uh, uh, Steve asked me to come and participate in the beginning of your school year program, the Green Uni Initiative. I have to get that pronunciation correct because I know you guys are affectionately known as the Unis, and I, I really uh, think that's a marvelous kind of mascot. Of course, at NC State, we're the wolf pack but I can guarantee you we're a friendly wolf pack. We're no threat to the unis, so uh, just don't worry about that. It's all about uh, sustainability and taking care of each other. 
I'm really thrilled to be here to talk with you today about uh, this particular theme area, energy, environment, and sustainability. And I appreciate uh, the, the introduction from Caitlin and all that uh, Steve has done. But more importantly, I really appreciate the school's commitment to a full year of thinking about energy, environment, and sustainability, and the student projects that are going to emerge therein. It's a tremendous framework for not only advancing sustainability, but also uh, thinking about your own personal lives in a new context, and also your professional lives that will emerge in a slightly different context. And that's really the theme of what I want to do today. So the title I've chosen is Advancing Sustainability with a New Environmental Agenda. And so what I'm going to talk about is really two pieces. If we can get this, uh, I'm not sure. It worked a moment ago. We're going to talk about what sustainability really is. I guess the laser pointer. Yeah, do you have a laser pointer there, Steve? What I really want to talk about today is first, uh, the idea if we're going to advance sustainability, what do we really mean by that? And secondly, if we're going to talk about the new environmental agenda, what do we mean by that? Two issues here to think about in this title. And they're kind of summarized nicely in this figure that I've taken from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change developed this nice figure that shows the relationships between uh, human systems and Earth systems. And that's really the fundamental nature of this discussion about sustainability and environmental science, exploring that relationship between human systems and Earth systems. And this is a perfect fodder for a group of students who are interested in science and mathematics. So let's take a look at the question, what is sustainability? Sustainability is most commonly understood to be a term that is taken from a report called Our Common Future, uh, generated by a committee chaired by uh, Gro Brundtland. And the term of sustainability that's most commonly used really refers to this term sustainable development. Sustainable development, literally from the, uh, the book Our Common Future, or the report, uh, means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That would mean to say that you could meet your needs today without affecting the options for your children and their children to meet their needs. Now this is the common definition of sustainable development or the most commonly held concept when you ask people, what do you think sustainability means? This, is be, this will be exactly what you'll get back. Let's take a look at the feasibility uh, that this could actually happen. That is, you could meet your needs today without affecting the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Oops, wrong way. So, sustainable development. I asked the question, is that really possible? Well, let's take a look at some of the issues. We have finite reserves of fossil fuels. We know that. We understand there's this issue of climate change unfolding. We understand that we're using fossil water at a rate that's much greater than it's being replenished in the large aquifers under the continental landmass. We know there are massive extinction rates. We're losing 30,000 species a year to extinction. That's three times the background rate of extinction. Invasive species, we're spending billions of dollars a year trying to control the damage from invasive species and human population growth. Recently, we just hit 7 billion on Earth. About 1.5 billion live in the developed world. Another 5.5 billion live in the underdeveloped world that's flat. Those people now have access to the web. They know how we're living, and guess what? They want to live like we do too. 
In addition, we can expect global population to top 10 billion within your lifetimes, easily within your lifetimes. That's another nearly 50% increase above the number alive today. And most of those who will be accounting for that large population growth on a global scale will be in Africa and Asia. They will not be in North America. And North America will continue the trend of diminishing as a percent of the global population. 5% becoming 4% becoming 3% of the global population. Is it really possible with these kinds of issues on the table to think about sustainable development? And I question whether that's really even a, a logical uh, step to, to take in the rational world. Uh, and I've highlighted here in italics two questions. I want to explore, I can't explore all of these in some depth, but I will explore finite reserves of fossil fuels and the issue of climate change. So let's take a first look at fossil fuels. Is it possible we can continue using fossil fuels without compromising the ability of the future generations to use fossil fuels? And I submit we can't. We simply cannot do that. And here you see uh, an example of why we cannot continue to do this. This is a uh, kind of coal mining that takes place called mountaintop removal. How many of you have heard of mountaintop removal? All right, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. Now, uh, you can see from this picture that this simply is not sustainable. We can't continue to do this to our landscapes. It's, it's simply not sustainable. And interestingly, this mountaintop removal is not taking place in some remote part of Eastern Europe. It's not taking place in some remote part of South America or Africa. It's taking place in West Virginia, a neighboring state, who are mining the coal out of the Appalachian Mountains in this fashion. That's how far we're pressing our need to get coal, a finite fossil fuel, not sustainable. We can't continue to do this. Well, what about petroleum? I don't mean natural gas here, I mean petroleum. Petroleum is also a finite reserve, and you don't have to remove mountaintops to get it, but we're using it at a pretty high rate. So reserves of fossil fuels are finite, and uh, what you see here is a graph that shows the uh, production from all the wells, the nap or the uh, petroleum uh, wells, and the production capacity of the petroleum wells in the United States since uh, 1900. And what happened is, initially, the production rates were low, and then every year, the production rates increased until we got to about here, 1970. 1970 was a benchmark year because that marked the highest rate of petro petroleum production from our reserves uh, this nation has ever seen. Since 1970, the production rate has dropped in the United States. The ability to get petroleum from our reserves has dropped, and it's going to continue to drop. So our peak was in 1970, and the prediction from Hubbard is that the production curve over time will be a bell-shaped curve. And so far, his predictions have been pretty close to right. Pretty close to right. So that explains something about why, if we could imagine, if we continue using petroleum reserves in this country, we're affecting and impacting the capacity of those future generations to use petroleum from our own uh, national reserves. Well, Bill, what about the issue of we can just buy all the oil we need so those future generations are gonna have plenty of oil, there's no problem. And actually, um, it's interesting to think about that question because here's a curve that shows the petroleum production from different parts of the world. This is not just the United States. In fact, this green curve in the bottom here shows the U.S. oil production in relation to other parts of the world. Here's Europe. Here's Russia. Here's the Middle East. 
And we've got some other places here that are, are a little less important, but I don't want to dwell on um, actually where all these places are. But what I do want to dwell on is the idea that the shape of the curve we saw, the bell-shaped curve of normal distribution that we saw for the United States is not so much unlike the curve of production of oil from wells from all countries in the world. So the question is, if this is a peak of oil production about now, and we're seeing it fall off, we're seeing it fall off, what does that mean for those future generations, and how long will we, in fact, have oil uh, as a global commodity? Well, in all candor, there are a number, in fact, most believe, uh, most uh, petroleum geologists believe that these uh, peak oil curves will in fact play out in our future. Something like you see on these graphs. So here again is that global pattern. But I've found an interesting figure that shows us what peak oil production would look like if we considered an entirely different time frame. This is 1930 to 2050. What if we thought about oil and use of oil, uh, petroleum, in a much bigger context? And let's start this time at the time of Christ and extend the future out to 2500. This is what the petro petroleum uh, sector would look like as its availability to uh, humankind. So in roughly uh, 300 years, we're going to blow through the total global supply of petroleum, then there won't be any. That's the vision for petroleum uh, geologists who believe in these peak oil estimates of production. Now there is a subset of folks who think differently than the peak oil situation. They say the existing reserves uh, of petroleum are large. And there are some yet that are undiscovered. So they're willing to extend this tail of this curve out uh, further than the peak oil uh, analysts would show. They say there are new extraction techniques. For example, the Bakken Formation in North Dakota and Montana is a horizontal shale deposit that contains natural gas and oil. And with horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, they can extract not only natural gas, but also petroleum from that formation, increasing the productivity of petroleum from it. So there are new extraction methods that might extend our finite reserves out a bit further. There's uh, the possibility of discovering new reserves, the Arctic Slope, for example. Um, and in addition, rising costs of petroleum as it becomes harder to get will force people to find alternatives to fossil fuels, in this case petroleum, and extend the longevity. And there'll be fuel switching. So there's some hope that we can extend the use of fossil fuels out uh, for some decades. But the question still remains, is this the vision for how fossil fuels are going to impact the societies of the world over the time course of, of uh, the 300 years or so? And the answer is, in all likelihood, it's going to look something like that. We are going to be affecting the capacity of future generations to use petroleum. So when we think about uh, that first set of questions in italics I showed you a moment ago, um, what about the finite reserves of fossil fuels? Let's take a look now at the second issue that I talked about that uh, pertains to the way uh, sustainability might affect future generations, and I want to touch on climate change. And I want to start with a series of three related questions, and I'm going to ask in a survey of this audience right now to raise your hand if you believe in climate change. I'd like to see how many folks believe in climate change. Quite a few, you know, just counting here, it's like 60% or so, I'd say, um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a number, believing in climate change, all right? You ready for the next question on this test? You're not gonna get graded. How many of you think climate change is real? I'd like to see a show of hands. Now there's fewer hands by far, maybe 25% of the audience with their hands up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready for the third and last question? Okay. 
Here's the third and last question. How many of you know climate change is real? I'd like to see hands up. Now we're even fewer. We're sort of in that 10% range, I'd guess. We're sort of in that 10% range. I want you to think about this for a second and go ahead and take a few minutes or a few seconds to talk with your neighbor. This is an interesting, this is an interesting set of questions. Okay, okay, let's come back to focus. Let's come back to focus, because I have some insight about this that you might be interested in. The first question, how many of you believe in climate change, is a question that pollsters commonly use. How many of you believe in climate change is a question that was asked during the first Obama campaign four years ago. At that point in time, the economy was fairly good, and we knew we were headed into a recession, but even then, 60% of the public said, we believe in climate change. Now, that number's down to 40%, public opinion. This is a pollster's question. Do you believe in climate change? And it's interesting because of the word believe. That's the key word here. Now, this is the School of Science and Mathematics. Maybe somewhere in North Carolina, there's a school of beliefs. But, and that might embrace religion and other things, but that's not what we're about in environmental science. That's not a part of the new environmental agenda, and beliefs have little to do with true understanding of the real rational world. So when I change the question, how many of you think climate change is real, we're now treading closer to the real rational world, and we're asking a question about, given what you know, given what you know, do you think it's likely that there is climate change? And uh, about 25% agreed, but finally with the question, do you know, are you certain that climate change is real? There's only about 10%. So what I'm gonna do now, is I'm going to tell you the answer that you need to have in your back pocket. This is an important take home message. If anyone ever asks you if climate change is real, you say with complete certainty, I know climate change is real. And you'll be right. Let me show you. You'll be right about climate change. Here's a figure that I've got a lot packed into, so I'm gonna unpack it a little bit. What you see in blue here are glacial periods of the Earth history starting 650,000 years ago. The blue represents periods when glaciers advanced. The yellow represents periods where glaciers retreated. And you can see over the last 650,000 years, there have been glacial advances and retreats throughout the history of Earth. In fact, climate has never been stable on Earth. It's always changed. So the answer to the question, is climate change real? Yes, it is real, and you know it's real. The only way glaciers can advance and retreat is with climate change. It's real. Now, there's more in this figure, so let me take you to the next part of it. The next part of it is this axis which shows the CO2, the history of the atmospheric CO2 concentration of Earth. And that concentration is shown with this line that goes up and down. And the important part is that when the CO2 concentration is below 230 parts per million, glaciers are advancing. And when CO2 concentrations are above 230 parts per million in the atmosphere, glaciers are retreating. There's some relationship between CO2 concentration in the Earth's atmosphere and the advance and the retreat of glaciers. And that relationship has held for 650,000 years, that relationship has held. 
thinking about 650,000 years, here's where humans came to Earth as a species. Maybe two to 250,000 years ago. Climate was changing before we got here. And climate changed after we got here. Now, thinking about this y-axis a little more carefully, notice that over the 650,000 year history, CO2 concentrations never got above 310 parts per million in our Earth's atmosphere. Today, this is the data point for today. In fact, it's now 395 parts per million today. We're off the scale with our CO2 concentration. We're off the scale. When I give this lecture and show this slide five years from now, I'm going to have to go on to the next slide to get that data point on this figure at the rate CO2 is increasing. So now let me ask the question, how many of you know climate change is real? That's better. That's better. There are always some skeptics. Always some skeptics. A little more about climate change that's interesting. The understanding of climate change and the forces of atmospheric greenhouse gases is not a new theory advanced by uh, scientists in the last 20 years to generate research money for their research programs or to make them famous. No, 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 no. The idea of CO2 and greenhouse gases affecting the temperature of Earth goes back much farther than that. In fact, it goes back to Cervante Arenas. He lived from 1859 to 1927. He was a very eminent scientist of the day. He won a Nobel Prize. He's a member of the Nobel Committee. He was in the Swedish Academy of Sciences. He defined activation energy in chemical reactions. He was a chemist. He was a physicist. And one of the questions that was vexing to him was, they had just realized that glaciers advanced and retreated. The geologists had revealed that. And he wanted to know why they would do that. Why would glaciers change in their distribution and size? And then he started thinking about Earth temperature. And he started thinking about the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. And he realized the greenhouse gas potential that CO2 has. And he came up with the theory in the early 1900s that CO2 was an important gas that allowed our Earth to have a habitable temperature for humans, and that further he predicted that if we burn fossil fuels, the greenhouse gas concentration would go up and Earth would warm. Based on the first principles of science, long, long ago, more than 100 years ago. This, is, this idea of climate change and the anthropogenic cause of it is not a new half-baked idea. It's not new. It goes back a long time. So here's a look at how we've been with respect to CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels. And you see different, uh, uh, here you see the real curve of actual emissions. And here you see in the uh, late 1990s, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made several predictions of how CO2 emissions would change over time. And uh, the steepest slope was kind of their worst case scenario, and this slope was kind of their best case scenario. And the actual emissions have actually um, put us pretty much on track with the worst case scenario. Now there's a blip in emissions here, but that blip wasn't because we wanted to reduce CO2 emissions, that blip was because the global recession reduced the use of fuels. It was an unintended consequence of a horrible financial disaster from which Earth's uh, ec economies are still struggling to emerge. So we've been emitting increasing amounts of fossil fuels uh, on a global basis. 
And not only that, the outcome, as you might guess, of putting more CO2 into the atmosphere is that the CO2 concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere will increase. And this is the famous Keeling curve, showing their direct measurements of CO2 concentrations since before 1960 all the way to current times. Um, they make these measurements at Mauna Loa Observatory in uh, on Hawaii. Hawaii is an interesting place. It is the place that's most remote on Earth. It is farther from a continental landmass than any other place on Earth. It's 3,000 miles from anything of any significant size. So it's not profoundly, it's CO2 concentrations at that location, not profoundly affected by continental landmass activities like industry. And what you see at the height of Mauna Loa is what is believed to be the integrated average of CO2 concentration for the Earth's atmosphere. Now, you can see that the brown line here is the mean value for every year, and there's a sawtooth pattern with the decrease every year related to CO2 drawdown because of photosynthesis in the northern hemisphere, and then the peak every year is related to the winter when temperate zone photosynthesis um, is much, much less. So here we have the idea that yes, we're emitting increasing amounts of CO2, and yes, the outcome is CO2 concentrations are increasing in the Earth's atmosphere. Well, what does that mean about climate and stuff like that? Uh, so that's all atmospheric chemistry. Well, um, let's take a look at, at the impacts of, of what we might think to be climate change. Here you see a global map showing 6,000 temperature stations that meet all the requirements for official sanction for the way they gather data. There are 6,000 of them now around the world, and not all of them not all of them have been around since 1880, but a lot of them have. So you can see the lights where all these stations are, and the ones that are 150 years old are clustered here in North America and parts of Europe, and then there's some more recent ones that are 70 years old and so on. So we have 6,000 uh, temperature measuring stations around the world. What do their data look like? Here they are, here are the direct measurements of temperature of Earth from all those stations averaged since 1880. Now, this scale, the y-axis, is the global temperature anomaly in degree C. And what that means is they went to the period 1961 to 1990 and said that's going to be the mean value. And anything greater or lesser than that will be the anomaly. And so what we see is based against the mean value of temperature between 1961 and 1990, temperatures have been increasing sharply against this mean value. And in fact, we're at about half a degree C. And in fact, July was the warmest month ever recorded going back more than 100 years, and this year was the warmest year ever recorded, and this decade was nine of the 10 warmest years ever recorded. Climate is changing. Weather is getting warmer, and weather and climate are different. Weather is the temperature, the humidity, the wind, and barometric pressure, and so on today. Climate is the average of all that over periods of years and decades. And we're now approaching a point where we can see over a period of decades, and in this case, perhaps a century, where climate is changing. But we don't need to look at thermometers to know Earth is warming. This is a picture of the polar ice cap, as if you were to be in space looking straight down at it. This picture shows the polar ice cap and this pink line represents its normal range in September. For more than a century, its normal range in September was like this. But in September of 2005, it looked like this. 
it was shrunk back from its normal range. In September of 2007, the geographic extent of the polar ice cap was like this. It's much smaller than this. We lost over a million square kilometers of polar ice cap between September of 2005 and September of 2007. Now, since 2007, the polar ice cap hasn't shrunk a lot more in geographic extent, but it's gotten thinner. It's melting. The glaciers in Glacier National Park are disappearing. The Mendenhall Glacier near Juneau, Alaska is retreating. Glaciers around the world are disappearing. The Greenland ice sheet is melting at record rates. All kinds of signs that Earth is warming all around us. Well, not only is Earth warming, but it's going to be warmer and warmer and warmer for the foreseeable future. Here, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, shows temperature trends going back to 1900, and then predicts temperature trends if CO2 caps at 335 parts or 385 parts per million. If CO2 caps at 550 parts per million in the year 2100, we'll be looking at a two degree C temperature change. If it's at 850 parts per million by 2100, we'll be looking at a four degree temperature change. And the temperature change that takes place will be largely in the northern latitudes. Does that mean North Carolina won't be impacted? No. North Carolina has a dog in this fight. And our dog in the fight, and where we look at climate change straight in the teeth, is with sea level rise and what's happening with the Outer Banks and the coastal part of North Carolina. And not only is it a North Carolina story, it is a national story, and it is a story that's unfolding in nations around the world that have uh, coastlines. Sea level's rising. There's no question about it. Earth is going to get warmer. No question about it. Another interesting thing about climate change is that humans have always coped with it. Here's a map that's very interesting to me for a number of reasons, and I'll just focus on one of those, uh, one of those facets in this map. This map um, gets to the point that humans evolved as a species right here in Africa, maybe 250,000 years ago. But we stayed there. We didn't move anywhere. We stayed there until about 80,000 years ago. 80,000 years ago, humans made their first great migration, and that first great migration took them to Australia. It took them 40,000 years to make this migration. The Aborigines have been there for 40,000 years, no longer than that. About 25,000 years ago, there was a migration into Europe, where we overlapped for a little bit with Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon. About 20,000 years ago, the migration went to Asia. And about 15,000 years ago, it went to the New World. People have only been on the New World, the continents of the New World, for 15,000 short years. That's a blink of an eye in Earth history. Now, the interesting thing about it is this all ties into climate change because the only way this migration to Australia could take place was during an ice age when much of the Earth's water was tied up in ice, sea level was much lower, and people could make this migration without sailing vessels. And most of the physical anthropological evidence of this migration is now underwater. It doesn't exist. In addition, when this ice age was unfolding, allowing this migration, it blocked people from immigrating into Europe. And when the glaciers retreated, people then made their move into Europe and across to Asia. But another ice age made it possible for a handful of people to make it across the Bering Strait. So humans 
my point here is humans have always responded to climate change. We've always been affected by it. We've always dealt with it. It's always been a part of our existence. We've just forgotten about it because we're not quite as smart as we think. It's always been a part of our natural history. That relationship between earth systems and human systems has played out again and again and again. And climate change has always been a part of our legacy. And it will be a part of our future. So what's the big idea here? Well, the big idea is that rather than arguing for sustainable development and the myth that we could meet our needs without compromising the needs of future generations, let's abandon that and let's start talking about advancing sustainability. And that is simply, humans are gonna be industrious, we're gonna have endeavors, we're gonna have social development, we're gonna have economies that want to grow and must grow. But let's reduce the impacts of how all that happens. Because another big idea is that human activity is of such scale that we are changing the physical and chemical climate of Earth. And by that I mean the physical would be the temperature, humidity, rainfall patterns of Earth, and the chemical climate would mean the atmospheric CO2 that's changing on a global basis and the presence of other greenhouse gases and the changes in the biogeochemical cycle of nitrogen that's taking place worldwide and the sulfur cycle and the hydrologic cycle all being modified by human activity. And as we do so, as we change, as the scope of our activity changes the physical and chemical climate of Earth as a whole, we're affecting all life on Earth today and for tomorrow. There's no escaping that, that responsibility. So we've talked some now about sustainability. Let's switch to part two and let's talk about the new environmental agenda, what that means. Now the new environmental agenda is a term that implies that there's an old environmental agenda. And just what is that old agenda? Well, the old agenda is things like clean air, clean water, the national environmental policy uh, that was defined by the NEPA or the National Environmental Policy Act, endangered species, land use practices, and many other things. This environmental agenda is extremely important. That old agenda is really important. It developed because we had rivers that caught fire because there was so much uh, pollution on them. We had uh, people uh, die in acute air pollution episodes. We had, and still have, endangered species that go extinct because of, uh, uh, of land use practices. And so laws were passed, and this became part of what we might think of as the old environmental agenda. Okay, so what's the new agenda? Well, the new agenda is all those things, those important things that are in the old environmental agenda, along with a bunch of new stuff. The new stuff, climate change, energy and environment, global change and biological diversity, global environmental health, human population growth and enterprise, environmental equity and justice, food security for a growing global population and many other topics that go far beyond the old environmental agenda. So what does this new agenda mean to you? And I'll give you a simple idea. Prepare for a changing world because the world you're living in right now is not sustainable, we know that. And it's changing more rapidly than ever before. The rate of change is accelerating, not only in climate, but the rate of change of economies, of industry, changing very, very rapidly. No one could have envisioned the financial collapse and the rate and the extreme nature of the financial collapse that took place over the last five years. So prepare for a changing world. Here's some key ideas. First, life will be the same, but different. Second, it's an energy economy. Third, emerging technologies will become dominant. Emerging social trends will become more clear to you. And the key is to build new careers to rebuild the economies of the world, including the economies in North Carolina. 
So let's take a quick look at each of these um, five ways or five issues that you can think about in preparing for a changing world. Life will be the same but different. Cars, yeah, we'll have cars, but they'll use an array of fuels. Homes, you bet we're going to live in houses, but they're going to be different. They might have green walls. They're just going to be different, more energy efficient. Energy, we're going to make some from renewable sources. Electricity, we're going to have a smart grid and increased energy use efficiency with smarter buildings and smarter appliances. New materials, new design, new technologies, new products, and new policies to reduce resource use. Does that sound like anything you'd be interested in doing? All of those things are going to provide you with career opportunities for green jobs to advance sustainability. What about this, it's an energy economy concept? Well, let's just take a look at cars. I've mentioned cars several times. Cars, the operation of a car takes gas, oil, and batteries. So right there, we're looking at energy, energy, energy. But in addition, the cost of the car, when you buy a car, what are you paying for? Well, you're paying for the cost of someone to go out and dig the ore that was the metal, that becomes the metal, the heat to smelt it and to transport it. Plastics in the car, you're paying for the petroleum, the energy to produce it. Glass in the car, you're paying for the silica that was mined, the energy to produce the glass and to transport it. Well, but what about the labor costs that are here? You can see how all those uh, costs of the car are embedded energy costs. What about the labor? Well, as it turns out, one way to think about labor is that you're just giving money to the people who did this work so that they can pay for their energy costs. Car insurance, the costs of risk to replace your car if it's being financed. Collision insurance to replace uh, the damage or to repair the damage you've done to others, including the labor, which again is really a measure of money that's given to others so that they can pay for their energy costs. So if you're thinking about an energy economy and that all the exchange of money that takes place is really about direct and embedded energy costs, think of your earnings in your career and your lifetime in terms of energy. What kind of energy do you want to produce because you're going to have to sell it? Do you want to develop renewable energy, manage a business, reduce your energy use and profit in the way energy is being used and distributed? Do you want to create energy policies? But similarly, not only think of your energy, your earnings in terms of energy, but think of your spending in terms of energy. How do you want to spend your money and how does that impact the universe of energy. What energy do you want to buy? Do you want to buy fossil fuels? Do you want to buy renewable energy? Do you want to buy products from efficient energy practices? So begin thinking about your economic exchange really in terms of energy. I mentioned something about emerging technologies that will become dominant. Here are some. E-vehicles, wind and photic uh, energy sources, solar fuels and carbon sequestration, smart grid and smarter buildings, new batteries, nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, analytics. Analytics, emerging field of using massive amounts of data that comes streaming in from the smart grid, smarter buildings, the health industry. Massive amounts of data come streaming in. How do you get information from the data? That's analytics a huge field. Students interested in science and mathematics be thinking about analytics. Healthcare and drugs and technologies, waste recycling, and many, many more applications of new emerging technologies that will become dominant. And you have a vested stake in participating in developing these technologies in a way that contributes to building, uh, rebuilding our economies. What are some emerging trends that are important? Reduced federal spending. There's going to be a massive reduction in federal spending for all programs. As a result, there will also be reduced state spending. So think about higher costs for education, higher costs for health care, higher costs for food, higher costs for energy, 
fewer jobs and careers in the public sector because the federal spending and state spending are going down, more jobs and careers in the private sector because that's where the capital's piling up, more global networks, more focus on environmental equity and justice and all those peoples around the world who want to live like us, and a greater recognition that environmental responsibility really equals economic responsibility. And by that I mean that when we impose a policy to protect environmental resources, it's not a drag on the economy, because those costs, when you look at them carefully, boil down to hiring people, buying equipment, developing new equipment, new products, new technologies, and advancing our economies. So it's taking money being spent in one area and redirecting it, but it's not losing money from the system at all. And when you gain environmental quality as a result, that's an added value. I want to talk about your prospects for green jobs. First of all, you should know that the green economy is large. These data are from 2010 from the Brookings Institute. And what you see is that in biosciences, there are about 1.4 million jobs. Fossil fuel industry, 2.4 million. IT has the most, 4.8, at least in these data. The clean economy has 2.7 million jobs in it, in our, in our nation right now. 2.7 million. That's a lot. Not only is the green economy large, but it's a good career. Against the national average, where 5.4% of the jobs are held by scientists and engineers, the green jobs, 10% of them are science and engineers, scientists and engineers. In terms of green collar occupations, 68% are in green economies, whereas 42% are uh, for the national average. These would be people, the accountants, the secretaries, and others who are supporting the, the green economy. In terms of low-wage jobs, 28% um, is the national average, but only 6.3% for uh, the green economy jobs. So the green economy is large, and the jobs are good. Even more importantly, the green economy is growing. And here you see two estimates of job growth since 2003. This is an estimate from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Here's an estimate from the National Established uh, Time Series. And here are the uh, increase in clean economy jobs. And if you take away the private sector, that line comes down a little bit. So this tells you how many of those jobs are in the, pri are in, the, uh, in the public sector, excuse me. This tells you how many jobs are in the public sector, green jobs. So green jobs, it's a big economy, they're good jobs, and the number of jobs is increasing. So we need to prepare students from all disciplines for career in this new environmental agenda. We need to transform, for example, the existing use of fossil fuels. And here, students interested in earth sciences, they need to get busy and help us do that. We need to create policies for bringing existing technologies to market. We need people with backgrounds in business and law and economics to help us do that. That can be you, that can be you. We need to create new technologies, so we need engineers, biologists, chemists, and physicists to help us there. We need to build a smart grid and smarter buildings. We need to develop these analytics. We need to work in existing corporations to redo their energy use and resource use. And we need to educate the public about a new environmental agenda and a new way of thinking about energy. We need teachers who will do that. So, Across an array of careers, you're going to find this issue of the new environmental agenda being front and center and important to you. Faculty here at the School of Science and Mathematics can help. They can help by rethinking their courses and their curricula, and they're doing that.
that can participate in the local, state, national, and global discussions. And Steve made it quite clear that you're a part of the State Board of Higher Education discussion on those issues. Connect the academic programs to the private sector and seek contributions from all disciplines in an interdisciplinary way. Connect the act activities to the public and guide students to use the campus as a laboratory as they do projects. And you have some really interesting projects lined up for this year. So the faculty here are doing their job. But what about you? How do you relate to this new environmental agenda? First, be a good citizen. Be an artisan. Let me be clear about that. Be an artisan. That means an artisan comes from the old days, not so long ago actually, where you trained with a master in a craft. And when you developed enough skill to create a masterpiece, you signed it. it put, you put your name on it. That made you an artisan. Each one of you needs to be an artisan. Each one of you, when you turn in that term paper, it's got your name on it. It says something about you and who you are and the quality of thinking and work you do. When you put your name on something, when it's a part of you, and when it's a product from you, have it be the highest standard it can be. So be a good citizen, be an artisan. Engage your school and engage your community. Another thing you need to do is plan for a compelling, tough career. Prepare academically and be responsible for your own learning. Your teachers are here to facilitate learning, not to be responsible for your learning. It's your mind, it's your education, you be responsible for it. And lead from your strengths. Form a positive vision for yourself, listen, think, and act. Now, a quick word about this new environmental agenda. We're embracing it broadly at North Carolina State University. We have world-class research and academic programs and outreach programs dealing with all of these issues. Air and water pollution, biodiversity, landscape design, and so on. Whatever your field of interest might be across the spectrum of this new environmental agenda, take a look at North Carolina State University. And one place you might look would be our new environmental sciences academic program. It's relatively new, about two years. You can get a bachelor's degree in environmental science, you can be an environmental scientist, imagine. That's a great idea. You can select a focal area from anywhere across the university as an environmental scientist. You can study abroad for a semester. You can prepare for a diverse array of careers from an environmental science background. Regardless of what your major might be at North Carolina State University, you can also do a minor in environmental science. If you want to learn more, you can go to our website, and you can see our website down here. So to summarize, first, let's work together to advance sustainability, reduce the footprint of the human endeavor, new technologies, new materials, new policies, new efficiencies, and new uh, conservations to reduce our footprint, but admit we do have a footprint. Second, let's participate in the new environmental agenda. Let's build, rebuild our economies with new careers and jobs, all professionals have a role to play, and be good citizens engaging your community, school, and workplace. Finally, lead from your strengths. Form a positive vision of yourself and how you're going to engage the future by embracing environmental issues throughout all of your life. And finally, consider NC State your next stop in a lifelong learning process. So I'll end with a pitch. So I've taken some time here to develop some new messages. And I hope there's still time for a discussion or a few questions. No? OK. Thank you. So we would like to thank Dr. Winter for coming to speak with us. And we have a small gift for him. So. Well, thank you very much.
if there's any way, if there's any way I or any of the others at NC State University or the other great universities in the Triangle can help you with your mission, all you have to do is ask. The colleagues I know are very interested in you, very interested in your school, and will do whatever they can to facilitate uh, the development of your education. So don't be ever hesitant to uh, send us email, give us a phone call, or contact us, however it may be. Thank you very much. So, you got some information, some things to think about. Let's see where we're starting from. Leslie Cho is going to introduce a short video to you that gives you some idea of how our students look at some of these issues. Let's welcome Leslie to the podium. Hey everyone, so um, me and Jay Young, we wanted to know what you guys think. So last week we interviewed some of you guys and this weekend, I compiled all of <laughs> Wait, sorry, I just saw the screenshot. It made me laugh. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. I spent a long time on it. This is urgent news, everyone. Sustainability is very important. We need to do our jobs to help the world. <laughs> Something to do with environmental con conservatism? Oh, I think that the green initiative is being more eco friendly. Something green, right? A program designed to get students informed and involved in environmental sustainability. Not using paper towels. In the bathroom when you're on hall. Instead of using a paper towel, just walk back to your room and dry your hands on your towel because that'll help save the trees and it'll save a lot of money for the school and it helps the environment. I can stop using as much paper in class. Don't leave the water on when you're shaving or brushing your teeth, um, which is kind of hard because sometimes you need lots of water, but the earth will thank you. If you can keep stuff unplugged, then keep it unplugged and don't have everything in all the time to conserve power. And turn off the lights when you leave your room. You can use eco-friendly water bottles, like this one. Recycling stuff. <laughs> Cans, bottles, and paper. They last and fast. Being resourceful and not, um, I guess, like being wasteful. Don't throw all of your paper away if you can recycle it. To live a sustainable life and minimize your effect on the environment. To be a good person. Being ecologically friendly is like a hip, is like a cool thing to do now. So some people they don't really believe in what they're doing and they don't really pay attention to it as much as they can. Like that doesn't really matter much if you're not helping out in other ways. Be aware of the environment, the environmental crisis, and to act accordingly to it. Using less energy so that you don't destroy the world. If you have a lot of single students, yes, totally. You can make a difference. Yeah. Because if one person recycles, then it sets an example for their peers, and the peers will follow their examples, and then they'll also recycle. Yes, very much so. Yeah, I think the guy at Convocation said, Every time you do something, you're casting a vote for something that you believe in. Whether it's choosing to study, or choosing to, I don't know, like, pick up a new hobby. 
I see that they really care about it, I think that maybe there's something to it. So I think with the sustainability project, if like just one student tries to do it, other people might catch on and it could grow from there. So definitely. Yes. It may be a small difference, but if all of these single students make these small differences, it really does add up. And even if there is only one student making a difference, it's still a difference. Uh, we should save Tabor by doing less homework. Maybe make a garden that uses drip irrigation, which is good because it doesn't waste water and stuff. Be conscious of what you're doing and what's making an impact on the environment. And, you know, if you really want to help, then just cut back and you know how you can do that. sustainable this year. I can like Do you want to start this off? No. Like if you don't need like your overhead light on, if you're just like sitting on your computer or something, just like cut it off and stuff. So we're going to um, release you to go to your 2.30 session now, but let me make an announcement before you leave. Listen, how many of you were supposed to be in Watts 6 for your sessions? Hold up your hands, okay? Watts 6, okay? The projector's not working in Watts 6, and so you are to go to Watts 2.13, okay? Enjoy your sessions.